Welcome to Developing Leaders of Mac Lake and to this episode of Leadership Pipeline Conversations. These are conversations we have with leaders and pastors who've built an intentional leadership development strategy and now are experiencing a culture of more and better leaders. Today's conversation is with Tim Allman. He's a pastor in Arizona of Christ Greenfield, and I know you're going to enjoy this episode. All right. Well, Tim, man, I've been excited about uh, this interview. Uh, I tell my team that when uh, I started working with you and your church through this process, I discovered your passion around leadership development pretty quickly. And I say, if if we ever put me and you in a room together uh, to talk about leadership development, I don't know that we would leave for days. I, <laughs> <laughs> I agree with that, bro. We'd have a heck of a good time. <laughs> we would. And because I, I, you just have such a passion around it. And, uh, and I, I enjoy that. So um, tell me, how, how did you develop your passion around leadership development? Uh, yeah, Mac, thanks for getting to chat with you today. This is fun. Uh, so, you know, as with anything, it's your story. And a lot of things are, are caught rather than taught. And I grew up in a very athletic household. Sports have been a big deal for me. So football, basketball, baseball as a football quarterback. And I think probably the quarterback experience, even into small college uh, life, played a played a big role in my story. Being a quarterback, kind of calling the play. But like if everybody doesn't execute, the line doesn't block, the receiver doesn't catch, you know, if the running back doesn't hit the hole. Uh, it, it's not going to work. And and so really Romans chapter 12 and first Corinthians chapter 12, uh, you know, where is the hand without the foot and all the eye and the head. So all of everyone playing their playing their role. And so I guess the, the quarterback, my life experience, and then just looking at uh, a theological dilemma and recognizing that, especially in my denomination, lay leadership was kind of downgraded, diminished, disrespected. Uh, the the kind of battle as about 14 years ago, I became a pastor, the battle between the Office of Holy Ministry, where a very traditional, you know, theologically rich uh, 500 year, basically going back to Martin Luther, I'm a Lutheran uh, story, but this kind of imbalance in the Office of Holy Ministry and the priesthood of all believers. And so wanting to play a small role in balancing that out and then just recognizing that Within our church and within many mainline denominations, uh, leadership development all the way up to ordination, it, there's a mega, mega shortage. And then as I entered it into Christ Greenfield in a lead role about a decade ago, saying, whoa, there are a ridiculous amount of people who are on fire for the gospel. And uh, we had lived for a significant period of time. I was the second kind of lead pastor here. And I hate using that language, by the way, but um, second lead pastor and came in and they lived through a, you know, a few decades of no. And as the the ministry kind of grew, the the kind of leadership culture didn't grow. And so they needed a, I'm 41 now, I was 31 when I was called and they needed a 31 year old kid to come in and say, I have literally Mac, no idea what I'm doing. <laughs> I'm going to need a, a lot of help. I'm passionate, you know, but I'm like a bull in a China shop. So someone has to give some structure and some guidance. And I just saw so many people on fire uh, to be released and to see the book of Acts come alive and in real time. And, and so, yeah, I guess that's, that's the genesis of it. And, and it's been a, a wild ride. <laughs> I, I think part of, I think part of your story, and I don't know the full story, but I think part of your story is you really brought some cultural transition there to, to that church. Uh, was a lot of that because of your passion around discipleship and development? Yeah, I think, Anytime, especially as a pastor, when you enter into something that already is right, yeah. there has to be a, a fit. And yeah, it was a it was a Holy Spirit inspired convergence of a group of people waiting to be released. And then I had been prepared my my previous story. My first five years, I started a, a ministry with a lot of young leaders at the time called The Table. It's a meal and worship. Uh, ex not not exclusively for, but it includes the those who are walking through seasons of mental illness and, and homelessness and such. And we had raised up a whole host of uh, kind of indigenous leaders 
who owned that that kind of church within a church experience. And and so when I came here, I had that that background. And then um, our governance model kind of evolved too, because that's another big thing. If your governance model is not conducive to releasing and allowing the pastor to set up systems and structures and not get voter approval for all sorts of, you know, every single month. Um, and we, we had been prepared as a congregation for kind of a leader like me ready to say, hey, Let's go. Let's try. Let's test. Build, measure, learn, fail forward, and 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 see what see what happens. And so, yeah, so the, I, it was that, it was that perfect marriage. Yeah, the culture was ripe for what you were bringing, and yeah. that's so good. Now, hey, tell me a little bit about your your vision as you look at your church. What's your vision for for developing leaders there? Oh man, um, I'm I'm like a decade. I think in decades. I'm a big, big picture guy. And I really see the story that God is uh, writing right now, telling through Christ Greenfield, having a ripple effect uh, through through our church body. And so the dream is that multiplication would would truly happen um, and that every pastor and church leader would go on the journey to you, you can't take someone someplace you haven't been. Right. So right. to learn to do but then to move quickly through doing and invite other people into life with them uh, to develop them just like, just like Jesus did. So, I mean, my big picture, this is, this may sound kind of audacious, but I love our theology, our Lutheran theology. I don't know how well you're aware of it, but um, the best parts of us is Christ for us. So passive righteousness, we do nothing to make ourselves right before God. And then we live in these kind of tensions, the now and not yet, the saint and the sinner, passive uh, righteousness, vertical, lived out horizontally and love for neighbor. So there's all these kind of rich teachings within our church body. Uh, but the systems and the the culture has been pretty much holding down. If, if you know Luther's theology, I mean, Luther was all about releasing the gifts to the body of Christ, giving the scriptures to the everyday common German man and, and woman to, to learn to read. And so I have a, I have a kind of could be pipe dream. I'm 41 by the time I'm, you know, 71 could, I have played a very small role in seeing the Lutheran church, Missouri Synod, or whatever it's called at that point, be one of the fastest growing Christian church expressions in, in America. Wow. That's so I really want to see multiplication happen far beyond just our church. Yeah. Yeah. And man, that's where it's going to happen. As the culture of the church changes, it, it can impact the culture of the denomination as well. Uh, and I, I know we'll get to this in a little bit, but you're you're working with other churches to help nurture that same type of spirit and passion in them mm-hmm. as well. Um, Tim, you guys uh, went through the leadership pipeline virtually over the past uh, year. Uh, tell me a little bit about how that impacted you and your team by going through the leadership pipeline training. Well, you Mac, uh, we're, we're kind of brothers from another mother, kind of separated by just a handful of years. But you wrote and systematized uh, what I probably would have done within the next decade. <laughs> <laughs> or so, you know, but so then when we met and we saw like your heart and, and your desire to to release and to develop a system that you implement kind of organically and to set up all of these wonderful conversations that move way down from from the lead pastor, because honestly, it it's overwhelming when you cast this vision, then like, oh, my goodness, I'm going to have to set up a ridiculous amount of, of training materials and, and develop kind of a framework. And we can, we can do that, but you have wisdom. You've set, you've tested up your, your framework really, really well. And so it was a hand in glove uh, relationship right from the jump. Our hearts as a a staff were prepared beautifully uh, to, to receive your materials and go on that journey. And, and I love, you know, we'd already been thinking, leading others, leading leaders, leading, you know, that kind of leading departments. And then, and then you wrote all these books. I'm like, dang, that's it. That's it. So yeah, with the, with the Missio Day, like if you're, if you're writing and uh, the, what you invite churches into hadn't been centered on the mission of God, the heart of Jesus to multiply disciples, it would have been a hard stop, but right. I knew your heart and, and heard, it, heard it numerous times. So yeah, it was it was perfectly timed for us. So praise God. That's the way the Holy Spirit works, right, dude? Yeah, 
You, you know, my favorite story coming out of, uh, out of your church was the last call we did with the team was Lee was telling your, uh, and what's Lee's role at the church? I can't remember. He's uh, one of our campus uh, directors. Yeah. And so she, uh, uh, she was talking about a, a couple of ladies that she was taking through, uh, I think she was taking through leading others and developing them. And one of the ladies brought her 12 year old granddaughter and she sat through the training and she said she participated. The young lady enjoyed the training. <laughs> so that blew me away. I was like, this is so cool that uh, even a 12 year old is participating in your leadership pipeline at that leader level. And uh, yeah. I loved it. I loved it. Thank you, bro. Well, uh, Tim, there are so many pastors and staff who are not passionate about leadership development. I work with churches all across the country. I see some people that are passionate about it, others that they don't get excited about it and uh, they want it because they're so busy and they feel the weight of doing so much. And and so they function as a doer versus a developer, but you don't see them developing a passion for leadership development. What what advice would you give those pastors or staff members who, who just don't have a passion for it? Uh, read the Bible. <laughs> I'm sorry, <laughs> but not to be like snarky or anything, but it's thick. If you have the lens to see development, I'm thinking of Moses and Jethro, right? What you're doing is not good. You're owning it all. And then you, you fast forward, obviously, to Jesus being the best developer of, of all time. If you can't see like Jesus deeply poured into a few in the hopes that they would multiply and they did. <laughs> He knew they would because the spirit, the Holy Spirit would come. Um, so yeah, just read the Bible and then and then just take a look with a fresh lens at the book of at the book of Acts, how how the church just spread out and you know, Paul and Barnabas and their missionary journeys and how they would have to identify, you know, people of peace and then men who could teach and how they had to trust the Holy Spirit. I think a lot of times our we don't as as pastors. We don't trust the the, the Holy Spirit, uh, that the Holy Spirit is going to give us uh, fresh eyes to have the scriptures be uh, awakened. And we want to we want to kind of control what the Holy Spirit wants to do. And that's a that's a tough place to be. The Holy Spirit can't be controlled like the wind. Right. And so um, another another point, too, is I think there's a lot of empathy for for pastors. Uh, just looking in, in my denomination, you know, the average size church. Uh, and let me let me back up. So the way pastors are trained in our denomination, if you're a young guy, you, you probably go to a university after high school, could be one of our Concordia Lutheran colleges. You do your Greek and your Hebrew there. You're in kind of a pre-seminary program. And then you're fully immersed for four years at a residential seminary. We have we have two of them. Um, and so it's just heavy, heavy head. Yeah. Right. Lots of content. And we do the best we can in those institutions to give them, you know, hands-on experience. We have a one-year inter- internship and things like that. But then you can get placed as a 26, 27-year-old kid at a, you know, a church worshiping 100 people. And they probably decline to the point where um, a lot of the good leaders <laughs> have left, right? And so they're they're all doing and they've got a lot of a lot of sheep there. Just be our shepherd. Just take care of us. And they've never. This was a big aha for me recently, Mac. They've never been discipled. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like actively in a discipleship relationship. So you can't take again some somebody someplace you haven't been. And so the invitation to just say, I need to, I need to be under an experienced pastor. Someone who has the heart of Christ. Uh, and there are numerous retired guys that would love a humble, young, 20, 30, 40 year old pastor to just say, hey, man, I need a lot of help. I'm yeah. in over my head. It starts with humility. Right. Yeah. And just saying, I need I need help. But the devil, man, he he tries to keep us, you know, self-reliant. I can I can do this and y- you just can't. So humble yourself and ask for ask for help. If Jesus asks for help. It's going to be better if I go away because I'm going to send the Holy Spirit. If Jesus asked for help, man, how much more do we need it? Yeah. Yeah. He spent the whole night in prayer before he selected his key leaders. Right. I mean, all night long praying and, and asking God, you know, which ones do you want me to select? And so, exactly. uh, but yeah, you know, I used to say that staff members uh, and, and even pastors, the reason they don't do development is they have an addition mindset versus a multiplication mindset. Sure. 
But, and, and I think there's a lot of truth to that. But nowadays I'm wondering, is it more that they have a survival mindset versus a multiplication mindset? They're just trying to survive and it yes. puts you in doer mode. And, uh, and, and, I, and something I saw recently, this, this sort of a new thought for me too, was, I was I'm working with a large church, uh, but they have a youth pastor that came from a small church background. And I love small churches. I grew up in a small church. And, uh, and so they're struggling getting this young man to develop leaders because he, he came from a background where he could do it all. Mm-hmm. And even for small churches, I did a video recently about church of a uh, size of like 50, how mm-hmm. even at that size, leadership development is so important. Uh, yes, you could do it all because the, the, the span of care is, is so small, but yes, you could do it all. But still develop that habit of developing others. Yes. And uh, man, it, it can take so much off your shoulders. And like you're talking about, it's releasing lay people to use gifts at higher levels that, that a lot of churches, they just don't get the opportunity. Yeah. So yeah, we could talk small church. I think I, we're, we're in our denomination considered a mega church, whatever. Um, but I think for a lot of our larger church kind of senior pastors, Mac, uh, the fastest way to grow a large church is around the personality of the lead gifted guy. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And it's true. I mean, I don't think it's, I don't think it's faithful. I think it's going to have a shelf life. You're going to die, bro. You know? Yeah. Yeah. And and so I think I think a lot of our larger churches that are very precarious place right now, um, as a lot of our longtime lead pastors are, are nearing retirement, what are we what are we going to do? And for us, we're then thinking that there's this like upward draft of leaders coming through our institutions that can easily step in and lead like that leaders led. And it's just it's just they're just not there. They they come and ask me, you know, a lot of the guys in that network, would you want to be in? Oh, no, I don't want to go to your church. I don't want your problems. You know, like you've created a culture that's all around you, bro. You know, yeah. and I don't I'm not you. So yeah. so yeah, it's um it's an interesting time and build them up from within. Identify the next lead pastor from within your congregation. But unfortunately, within our denomination, we've not set up the structures to really uh train them very very well. So yeah. How, what what are some things you do to get your staff uh, or keep them excited about leadership development or keep them accountable to it? Oh man, I think I think they know that I will not. I will do everything I can to use whatever influence I have within our congregation and within our our uh, wider district and then national church body to knock down barriers so that they can do what people have said they they can't do. Mm. Um, we, we don't ordain women within our denomination and we don't have to go into, into that, but we've got women right now getting a master of divinity and, and they love it. And yeah. they're teachers, Mac, like yeah. they have a teaching gift and they can, they'll bless not just women, but the, but the wider church. Um, and so, yeah, I think, I think it's just knowing that I and our, our senior executive staff as, you know, we got about 150 people who are within our, actively within our, our pipeline right now, leaders and coaches and, and whatnot, that this is a place where you can grow. And uh, we, we will not snuff out the Holy Spirit's work in your life. And we want to leverage all of the gifts, the experiences that you've had right now um, yeah. in the business world, into the church context. And there are so many. So I guess to answer your question really succinctly, there are just a ridiculous amounts of stories of people coming alive in our leadership development pathway pipeline. Thank you for the help. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and those stories, man, stories stick, yep. stories spread and stories shape culture. Right. And, and so that's one of the things I tell churches, you got to grab those success stories of where does, uh, where your staff and, uh, and, and especially volunteer leaders reproducing themselves and discipling leaders tell those stories and man, you can shape a culture uh, of leadership development. Yeah. There's one other thing. There's something about the human heart that loves adventure and not exactly knowing how it's all going to shape up. You know what I'm saying? So last night that that group of pre-seminary seminary students got together, pizza, salad, uh, no beer, even though we're Lutherans, we were doing water just last night, hanging out. It was it was awesome. But 
a lot of them have embraced this infinite mindset. I don't know exactly, God, what you're doing in my life, but I know I want to grow and I want to develop other people. I want to spread the gospel using the gifts and experiences that I've had. And man, it's just the best thing ever to, to fan into flame. Yeah. You know, I mean, part of, you know, you were talking about, you know, 30 years from now when you're 71, you know, 30 years from now when I'm 91, um, I want to see the discipling of leaders become normative behavior, not only for staff, but for volunteer leaders. Yes. Where uh, uh, just average Joe and, and Joette leader are reproducing themselves. That's why we created the Discipling Leaders book series, so that somebody can just take that book. It's simple. It's easily reproducible. But to see uh, small group leaders reproducing new small group leaders, children's leaders reproducing new children's leaders, uh, uh, you know, volunteer coaches reproducing new coaches, all of that. Right. And you know, what what do you say to a, a church that goes, well, I've never seen that, and I don't think that can happen. I, I Mike, Mac, that's a pipe dream that that'll never happen in my church. What what would you say to these church pastors? who don't see that as a potential for their church. I mean, I, again, I get, I'm a passionate guy, just like you are. And I get, I get frustrated. <laughs> and I'm like, uh, cause I'm going to our, our circuit. So there's about eight different churches in the East Valley of Phoenix here. And I've been down this road, talking with them, developing relationship with them. And one one brother who's uh, who's a pastor to be unnamed, uh, and I, I love this guy. But I said, do you do you have people that you could see, you know, growing, you know, starting a surf team and kind of growing even to be even to be a, a pastor or senior leader in your in your church? And he looked at me, Mac, and said, I don't I don't think so. Wow. <laughs> what? Wow. You, you don't believe you don't believe in the Holy Spirit gifting your people? You know, and this is a, this is a larger church, like people, um, I think the vast amount of folks, it's the 80, 20 rule, right? I think 80% of them are just kind of, okay. Yeah. The church does its thing on Sunday. Uh, but, but I, you know, maybe not anything beyond that. And I, I think there's a, there's a, re- a reformation in the church taking place right now among the willing to say, no, it's way more, it's way more than Sunday. Um, and, and I need to, I need to go on this journey. So yeah, I get, I get frustrated. Um, and it's a slow go. So to speak positively, it's what, what's in it. And I bet you've had this Mac, what's in it for you. You know, are you looking to grow something? Are you trying to step into my turf here and, and steal my people or whatever? And I'm like, no, I, we've just set up a framework. We developed awesome partnerships with guys like Mac, and and just just start and see what the Lord Lord does. Um, yeah. So, you know, I, I've discovered that when somebody has a passion for for discipleship, somebody has a passion for discipling leaders, it causes you to look at people differently. Mm. Your passion gives you different perspective on the other person. And I look at Jesus when he approached Matthew. Matthew was at the tax collector's table collecting taxes there at the port in Capernaum. And Jesus approached him and said, follow me. Matthew wasn't ready, but he was willing. And Jesus saw something in him and invited him into a team of of men that Matthew was taxing Peter, James, Andrew, John. Right. He was every time they come into port, Matthew would be the one taxing them. And, and Jesus is pulling them together. And he said, I see something in each of you individually. I see something in you collectively, but it's because of his passion for the mission, his passion for people, and his passion for development. And uh, it causes you to look at people differently. Yeah. And so, um, you know, what? Let, let's wrap up with this. I didn't have this question on the list, but let's wrap up with this, you know. Two to th- let's see if we come up between two of us. Three tips, three tips for stimulating passion uh, for leadership development, e- either in yourself or your or your staff. Anything yeah, you want? yeah. No, I mean the the first one is just see Jesus as the greatest leader developer of all time, and fall in love with the way he did it. Yeah. Uh, so and. Don't just look at the the words of Jesus and the works of Jesus, but the way of the way of mm-hmm. Jesus. 
Yeah. Yeah. If we miss that, we're going to. Yeah. He was, he was a developer. That's right. He he developed those 12 men as leaders and, and, and we've got to model, model that as well. I I would throw in there a second thing and I'd love to hear another one from you as well. Uh, Second thing I would throw in is get around developers. Mm. Uh, I I agree with you, what you said earlier. So many people have never been discipled and they've never, certainly never been discipled as leaders. Mm -hmm. So get around a developer and catch their spirit. And and if you don't know one, you know, find one on YouTube or or podcast or something where you can catch their spirit. And uh, if you catch your, if you catch the spirit for development, you'll find the way to develop the skill for development. That's right. And, and so many people stop me. Well, I don't think I'd be good at it. So they don't try. Well, mm-hmm. develop the spirit for it. Nothing will stop you. You'll figure out the why. Agree. Mm-hmm. Third one. Yeah. So, so Jesus, find a developer and then um, de- <laughs> develop someone. So find a younger, find a younger leader and invite them to do what you do. You yeah, know, fail on somebody. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. It will be awkward. And you're like, I don't exactly know this guy named Mac and Tim told me to, to do this, but would you want to come along and just hang out and, and, uh, preach, develop, you know, you'd see if a young 20 something has the, has a gift for, for teaching and, you know, let them, let them do what you do. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Just get started today. That's a, that's a great tip. Tim, thank you for joining me on this today. Uh, How can people learn more about you and uh, your church, uh, the uh, United Leadership Collective? Uh, How can we, how can we follow you? Yeah, I know. UniteLeadership.org is our website, weekly blogs. You could subscribe there. We're doing a lot of writing around this topic. Um, The reach is beyond the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod, but um, that's, that's kind of our, our lane working with a lot of churches in the Lutheran church, Missouri Synod and uh, T Allman at cglchurch.org is my, is my email address. This has been fun, Mac. Thanks, man. Thank you for joining me and, uh, guys, thanks for checking in and listening today as well. <laughs>